Since the arrival of Tiberium, both the Brotherhood of Nod and the Global Defense Initiative have risen to become the dominant factions on Earth. The many years of conflict between the two organizations required each one to increase their power, achieved by eliminating or absorbing other nations and groups. While most people died when exposed to the harmful effects of Tiberium, others were transformed into mutants. Cast out of society, these mutants formed tribes amongst their own. The most significant group called themselves the Forgotten. The Third Tiberium War saw the arrival of the extraterrestrial Skrin as a new, albeit short-lived faction on planet Earth, one that decisively answered the question of whether humans were alone in the galaxy. Despite the strength of these four major powers on the world stage, there were groups that weren't directly affiliated with any of them, and did their best to either maintain their neutrality, or offer their services to the highest bidder. Likewise, structures, vehicles, and supplies from previous conflicts would be left abandoned or lost in regions across the globe, only to be rediscovered and utilized by the major powers once a new conflict ignited between them. At the outbreak of the First Tiberium War, there were many nations and peoples who were unaffiliated with the Brotherhood and GDI. However, the status of these unaffiliated groups would change, as the war progressed and both factions attempted to sway these neutral groups in their favor. For the Brotherhood of Nod, the most common methods used to convince those on the sidelines to join them were fear, propaganda, and violence. In order to gain a foothold in North Africa, Nod landed troops in the country of Libya. Although Libya appeared to be under the influence of the Brotherhood, a village leader named Nekumbo was at odds with the group and needed to be eliminated. A new Nod commander was tasked with this mission. During the attack on Nekumbo's village, the Nod commander went up against GDI soldiers, or at least, villagers armed with GDI equipment. This was an indication that Nekumbo had come under the influence of GDI, making his elimination vital. All Nakumba's followers, mostly civilians, were killed in the conflict. With Libya now fully in the hands of the Brotherhood, they were able to use the country as a launching point to invade Egypt. This was one of many instances where the Brotherhood destroyed villages as they took over the continent. Most civilian villages were under the direct, or indirect, influence of GDI, which Nod used to justify their violent actions against them. However, others, such as during a special ops mission called Eviction Notice, were completely neutral. During this operation, Nod needed a place to set up a base in the region, and a nearby village was the perfect location. It had plenty of space to construct buildings, and a nearby Tiberium field that Nod could harvest. Once word of Nod's presence in the region reached the village, a couple of Brotherhood sympathizers amongst the population began attacking their own. When the Nod force arrived, their units burned down the entire village, and wiped out all civilians that hadn't shown their support for the Brotherhood. GDI's approach to civilians and other neutral groups was not as heavy-handed as Nod's. GDI typically opted to use cooperation to bring people to their side. This was often seen in the form of providing aid and protection to those civilians suffering under the toxic effects of Tiberium. Alternatively, it sometimes meant providing military weapons and equipment to villages to oppose the Brotherhood, such as the case with Nekumba. Another example was during the Mao Civil War in Chad, Africa, where two villages, one being backed by GDI and the other backed by Nod, fought for control of the southern half of the country. The village backed by GDI received weapons and other equipment to fight the Nod-backed village. The conflict escalated when GDI sent in their own troops to aid the villagers. In response, Nod moved their own forces into the region, eliminating both GDI's forces and the village they supported. Nod was able to spin this false flag operation in their favor, blaming the village's destruction on GDI. In Europe, Nod had stolen key components of Tiberium research from GDI and hid them in a local civilian town. An operation called Elemental Imperative was put together to retrieve the components. When the small GDI force arrived on the outskirts of the town, one of the locals offered to show them the exact location of the components under one condition. GDI troops would help free his wife who was under guard, along with other civilians, in a separate part of the town. After successfully freeing the man's wife, he snuck past Nod forces and put down a flare at the site where the components were held. The GDI force took down the remaining Nod contingent guarding the components, successfully retrieving them thanks to the help of this civilian. 
Crates weren't just used to carry vital components. They would carry a variety of supplies. While credits were the most common item to find inside a crate, there could also be weapons, medical supplies, and even units, all of which I'll discuss later in the video. While GDI may have achieved victory over the Brotherhood at the conclusion of the First Tiberium War, this victory in and of itself did nothing to prevent the spread of Tiberium across the globe. Over the years, Tiberium proliferation caused geological upheaval, contamination of waterways, ion storms, and new Tiberium-based flora and fauna that was hostile to humans. For many, it seemed like they were living in the end times, especially when the Second Tiberium War between GDI and the Brotherhood broke out in 2030. With the proliferation of Tiberium also came the rise of mutants. Humans who had been exposed to the crystal, but instead of dying, showed signs of genetic mutation and a variety of Tiberium-based maladies. The most noticeable physical alteration were the formation of small Tiberium crystals on their bodies. Largely ignored by GDI, and used as experiments by the Brotherhood, these mutants formed close-knit tribes, collectively calling themselves the Forgotten. The Forgotten established themselves as a third recognized faction during the Second Tiberium War, one that fought for both GDI and the Brotherhood, though some tribes remained hostile to both. There were other groups of humans who did not associate themselves with either of these three factions, seemingly hostile to all of them as well. Many of these, what I'll call rogue forces, took up residence around civilian armories and could be encountered on a few skirmish maps in Tiberian Sun and the Firestorm expansion. In the middle of the map, Grassy Knoll, there is a city which has a single well-trained assassin standing in the middle of it. This assassin will attack any GDI or Nod units nearby, and is especially good at taking out infantry with his suppressed rifle. Vehicles are best used to eliminate him. At the top right corner of the map, Grand Canyon, is a civilian armory and relay node. Both are guarded by a couple of SAM sites, a component tower upgraded with a Vulcan cannon, and a searchlight tower. The SAM sites and Vulcan cannon will attack any GDI or Nod forces that come within firing range. On the map, Storms, there is a village surrounded by cliffs. A Vainhole monster guards the pass to the village. Within this village is a tunnel which is guarded by two Vulcan cannon towers. If a commander wants access to this tunnel, they will first need to destroy the towers guarding it. However, the tunnel doesn't actually lead anywhere. The last map, titled Cityscape, has a group of insurgents on the right side of the map, who have taken control of a civilian armory, three titans, and six wolverine mechwalkers. The entire base is surrounded by a concrete wall, with troops stationed inside and outside the base. The presence of mechanized walkers seems to indicate that this base once belonged to GDI. This group of insurgents, possibly from the city's populace, broke into the base, taking control of the vehicles and armory, equipping themselves with GDI equipment. As with the previous rogue forces, these will attack anyone that passes in close proximity to their base. Another feature of this map, and others, is the sight of trains traveling around the city. While trains were utilized by both Nod and GDI to transport troops and supplies, they were also used by civilians, usually taking people from one town to another, or transporting them to districts within a single large city. These trains wouldn't stop for anyone, so if a soldier or light vehicle was standing on a track, the train would run them over, unable, or simply unwilling, to stop in time. Perhaps the most famous unaffiliated group encounter during the Firestorm Crisis was a cult led by a man named Mortimer, and located deep within a Tiberium jungle in Bolivia. These cultists took control of ancient temples in the region, one of which housed a fragment of the data matrix called the Tacitus. JDI's Daedalus science team was informed by the AI Cabal that they needed this fragment to fully translate the Tacitus, which they believe held the answers to saving the planet from its Tiberian demise. A small team, including a ghost stalker, medic, Juggernaut Walker, and an archaeologist named Valdez were sent to recover the fragment at night. This group did not expect to go up against Mortimer and his cult. The cult hierarchy was as follows. The believers were the lowest rank, wearing civilian clothes and only armed with pistols. Cult guards were the next rank, armed with pulse rifles and clad in military armor. 
Priests were next, armed with rifles and wearing armor similar to that of GDI's riot soldiers, or Nod's toxin soldiers. Being the cult's leader, Mortimer was at the highest rank. Mortimer must have been a charismatic individual to convince so many to join his cult. Mortimer also seemed to have the power to tame Tiberium Fauna, something that only the forgotten mutants were capable of doing. Fiends resided in the nearby Tiberium fields. Some of Mortimer's believers can be seen worshipping a floater, as well as nearby Vainhole monsters. As if taming Tiberium Fauna wasn't enough, Mortimer had the power to call down a small, localized ion storm. This indicated that Mortimer himself was a mutant. The Tacitus Fragment was held in one of three ancient temples in the region, all of which were guarded by the cult. Upon encountering the cultists, they immediately attacked the GDI search party, having a particular hatred for the mutant Ghost Stalker. According to its hieroglyphics, the first temple the squad reached was called the Temple of Time. While it did not contain the Tacitus, entering the temple seemed to suddenly turn night into day. The next temple the group reached was called the Temple of Thunder. Shortly after the archaeologists entered the temple, a thunderstorm suddenly formed nearby, the lightning striking a nearby blue Tiberium field, causing the crystals to explode around a group of cult believers and fiends. The Tacitus was not present at this temple either. At the final temple, called the Temple of the Tacitus, the squad went up against Mortimer and his remaining congregation. The Ghost Stalker killed Mortimer, and upon seeing the death of their leader, the remaining guards committed suicide, bringing an end to the entire cult. Though the Daedalus team was able to make the Tacitus whole again, this was the moment that Cabal launched his cyborg rebellion against mankind. The rebellion would later be brought to an end with the combined forces of the Brotherhood and GDI. After the Second Tiberium War, with the Brotherhood of Nod fractured and no longer considered a major threat, GDI shifted its focus from military spending to ecological recovery. The organization made a scientific breakthrough, discovery of the resonant frequency of Tiberium. This discovery enabled GDI to develop weapons that could break the crystal down at a molecular level, halting its spread. Thanks to these actions, GDI was able to avert the total collapse of Earth's natural environment. Near the time of the Third Tiberium War, GDI had redrawn the boundaries of the planet's surface into three zones, red, yellow, and blue. Red zones made up 30% of the Earth's surface, and were completely uninhabitable by humans due to total contamination by Tiberium. Blue zones made up 20% of the Earth, which suffered very little Tiberium contamination, and were largely untouched by years of war. Yellow zones made up the remaining 50% of Earth's surface. Yellow zones were scarred by war, severe weather, and fields of Tiberium. Much of the Earth's population lived in these zones. Many of the residents felt abandoned by GDI, often joining the Brotherhood of Nod in hopes of attaining a better life. Besides the Brotherhood, many Yellow Zone cities were run by warlords and criminal organizations, or have collapsed into total anarchy. Unfortunately, this key aspect of the Yellow Zones in Command & Conquer 3 isn't featured at all in-game, as conflicts and interactions within these zones are limited to the major factions of the Brotherhood, GDI, and Skrin. What is featured, however, are neutral structures, which all faction commanders can utilize against their opponents. These structures weren't just a unique aspect of the Third Tiberium War, as a couple of them were utilized by forces during the previous wars. During the First Tiberium War, hospitals under the purview of GDI focused on treating people who had fallen ill due to Tiberium exposure. As Tiberium continued to spread across the planet, some towns and cities were completely abandoned as GDI attempted to relocate populations to regions not largely contaminated by Tiberium. Not everyone evacuated though, as some people refused to leave their homes. Thus, hospitals still played an important role in providing medical attention for the local civilian populace. With the outbreak of the Second Tiberium War, both GDI and Nod would sometimes procure these structures using engineers, in order to provide medical aid for their own troops. Injured soldiers would make their way inside a captured hospital. Once healed, they would be discharged from the building, ready for another battle. Hospitals didn't just provide aid to regular humans, they would repair cyborgs too. During a mission to retrieve a couple of biotoxin trucks, 
Anod Cyborg received repairs at a nearby civilian hospital. The Brotherhood of Nod also used these hospitals as prison labs to perform experiments on humans and mutants. With the help of GDI, the forgotten leader Tratos was rescued from one of these buildings, resulting in a temporary alliance between this tribe and GDI during the Second Tiberium War. During his rebellion against mankind, Cabal needed to sustain his army by capturing humans and turning them into cyborgs. Hospitals provided the necessary facilities for Cabal to implement these conversions. These hospitals became vital targets for GDI and Nod to destroy, so as to stop or slow the creation of more cyborgs for Cabal's army. While technically neutral structures, civilian arrays would often end up being used by all factions as relay stations. Before rescuing the forgotten leader Tratos from the Brotherhood, GDI forces had to destroy three relay stations and a radar array to disrupt Nod's advanced sensor network in northern Mexico. The success of this mission allowed the Forgotten Rescue Party to infiltrate the Nod perimeter without alerting the Brotherhood to their presence. In the final battle to destroy Cabal's core during the Firestorm Crisis, JDI and Nod needed to disable civilian arrays, which were being used by Cabal to maintain the Firestorm generator that protected his core. When these three arrays were captured by engineers, Cabal's Firestorm defense system was brought down, leaving the core vulnerable to attacks. As previously mentioned, many rogue groups and forgotten mutants would set up bases next to civilian armories. Civilian armories were perhaps originally set up by GDI near major population centers as a way for civilians to defend themselves from attacks by Nod forces, hostile Tiberian fauna, or other rogue groups. It seems like most of these armories were easily taken over, or plundered for their equipment before being abandoned. However, the armories could still be useful to GDI or the Brotherhood. Once the civilian armory was captured by an engineer, a soldier could enter the building and receive extra training provided at the armory's facilities. Once the training was complete, the soldier emerged from the armory with more experience in comparison to his compatriots. These training facilities were only able to provide extra training to a limited number of soldiers. During the Third Tiberium War, GDI and Nod commanders battling in Yellow Zones would sometimes come across a large, abandoned structure called the EMP Control Center. These structures were initially constructed by GDI years before the war, as a way for local populations to deter attacks from Nod or other rogue militant groups. Field commanders should stay on the lookout for the four cylindrical towers of the EMP Control Center. These odd structures were erected during the last few decades in a number of Yellow Zones and Blue Zones as a deterrent to not attack. The theory was that a volunteer crew would race to the EMP Control Center when the civil defense siren sounded warning of an attack. They would fire off the EMP and disable attacking forces. After years with little not activity, the centers were mostly abandoned and are now being used opportunistically by GDI and NOD forces. Deploy a combat engineer to the EMP control center to capture it and use it against enemy forces. Once an engineer brought an EMP control center back online, it would take a couple of minutes for the structure to generate enough charge to be used. Once ready, the center would launch its pulse wave into the air, landing directly on top of the target location. This pulse wave was powerful enough to shut down base structures for several seconds. Its wave had a wide radius, able to shut down multiple structures built in close proximity to each other. More importantly, this attack could halt a sizable military force in its tracks, incapacitating all ground vehicles, making them sitting ducks against an opposing force. The EMP Control Center's attack was particularly devastating to aircraft, causing them to literally explode in the air. Even larger, more advanced aircraft like the Skrid's Devastator warships were vulnerable to this attack. Only Skrid units equipped with shields could absorb the EMP blast, preventing the unit from being disabled. After discharging its EM pulse attack, the control center needed a few minutes to recharge its capacitors before launching another. Another kind of structure that was built by GDI during the interim years between the Second and Third Tiberium War was the Defensive Tower. These tall, three-barreled gun towers were constructed at strategic locations throughout blue and yellow zones to defend them from attacks by Nod forces. Just like the EMP control centers, years of little activity, as well as cuts to GDI's military spending, caused many of these towers to become abandoned, though still functional. 
A GDI engineer or nod saboteur could garrison these towers and then put targeting parameters against their opponents. Once a target was acquired, the defensive tower would fire an accurate three round burst of shells. These shells were quite effective against light and medium armored tanks. While the gun could easily target a single infantryman with deadly accuracy, the rounds lacked any splash damage. This weakness meant that the tower could be swarmed by squads of infantry or vehicles, and be overwhelmed by the superior firepower. In addition, the tower had a minimum range, unable to fire down on units that were close to it. Another major weakness of the defensive tower was its inability to engage aircraft. This weakness was exploited by the Brotherhood during the Third Tiberium War, when trying to evacuate the liquid Tiberium bomb from Brazil. The quote, Guns of the Amazon, as they were called, were defensive towers that threatened Nod's ability to safely transport the liquid Tiberium bomb to an airport in Rio de Janeiro, and then fly it out to Kane's Temple Prime in Sarajevo. The Nod commander primarily used Vertigo stealth bombers to destroy three of these towers, clearing the escape route. Expansion points were another neutral structure that could be utilized on the battlefield. These raised, round platforms were not as common as the EMP control centers or the defensive towers. When captured, the expansion point provided ground control in the vicinity, enabling a commander to construct buildings in a short circular radius around the structure itself. Expansion points were typically set up near a Tiberium field, making them an excellent location to establish extended harvesting operations. It's not known whether expansion points were initially built by GDI, or perhaps a separate company within the initiative, similar to Tiberium Spikes. The expansion point's strategic value seemed to be limited, as an outpost or surveyor unit can perform the same task while being mobile. Not to mention the mobile construction vehicle itself, which could constantly move from one Tiberium field to another and establish new harvesting operations. The most valued neutral structures were Tiberium Spikes. Tall towers powered by a rotating array of solar panels. The landscape of many blue and yellow zones is dotted with tall cylindrical structures known as Tiberium spikes. These automated extraction platforms slowly pull Tiberium out of subterranean deposits and refine it on location so that resources are available for immediate use. GDI commanders are encouraged to commandeer Tiberium spikes in the field to help sustain their forward operating bases. A combat engineer deployed into a Tiberium spike can channel resources to the production structure of a base. Commanders are encouraged to provide compensation to the legitimate owners of commandered Tiberium spikes in the form of GDI vouchers that can be redeemed in Reykjavik for credits. Note that spikes extract at different rates depending on the size and nature of the underlying Tiberium deposits, so the flow of resources may vary from location to location. While Tiberium spikes were intended for use by private entities under the Global Defense Initiative, the Brotherhood of Nod were more than happy to capture these spikes with a saboteur and transfer the extracted Tiberium to their own bases. Tiberium spikes located in blue zones typically had a Tiberium silo nearby. These dome-shaped silos were owned by the same private entities that owned the spikes. Each silo could store a large amount of Tiberium. If captured, the silos would provide a one-time bonus of additional Tiberium, usually worth about 5,000 credits. If either a Tiberium spike or silo was destroyed, it would leave behind a cluster of green Tiberium crystals, which would slowly grow and spread outward, infesting the area. Sometimes, one could find bunkers placed around defensive towers, Tiberium spikes, or other neutral structures. As with the EMP control centers and defensive towers, these bunkers were probably built by GDI in the interim years between the Second and Third Tiberium War to be used by their own military personnel or civil defense groups to protect valuable infrastructure. These bunkers could have possibly been used as shelters for civilians to take cover in during a battle. Roughly three squads of troops could take cover inside a single bunker and engage enemy forces around it. The bunkers could withstand a lot of punishment before being rendered unusable, though a squad of Black Hand Flamethrowers, GDI Grenadiers, or Skrin Buzzer Swarms could quickly clear out the infantrymen inside while keeping the bunker itself relatively intact. A common mode of transportation for the civilian populace of Blue Zones was subways. Subway entrances were placed throughout an urban center and would all link to a central hub station. 
During battles between GDI, Nod, and Skrin forces, the commanders of each faction could take control of these hubs, giving them access to the entire underground network of subway tunnels. This enabled the commander to transport infantry units safely underground across the region from one entrance to another. There were even a few abandoned subway hubs in yellow zones that could be captured and reactivated to support combat operations in the region. Once a commander captured a hub, their troops would enter and exit the subway via an entrance. Only a limited number of troops could enter the subway. Using this underground network, a commander could outflank his opponent and gain access to various parts of the battlefield without leaving his troops exposed on the surface, where they could be killed by the opposing force. To stop an enemy commander from using a subway network, each entrance would need to be destroyed, burying the enemy's troops underground. However, traveling around the battlefield and destroying each entrance could be a time-consuming process, which is why it was more efficient to destroy the hub itself. Since the entire underground network linked back to the hub, its destruction caused the destruction of all the entrances associated with it. I will note that this outcome only occurs if the subway hub is captured. If the hub remains neutral and is destroyed, then the entrances themselves will remain standing, albeit completely useless. A few examples of subways being used during the Third Tiberium War include the Brotherhood's attack on Washington, D.C. After capturing a subway hub with a saboteur, the Nod commander used an entrance near his base to transport troops across the city. These soldiers would exit and wreak havoc on GDI's backline defensive positions. The Black Hand used this same tactic during their mission to capture GDI research scientist Dr. Giraud at the Chilean Blue Zone in South America. When GDI sent in a force to retake the city of Bern from the Skrin, they were able to reactivate a subway hub and use it to transport troops across the city, assaulting the Skrin's bases. Subways weren't the only networks used to transport units underground. A cylindrical-shaped structure called the Reinforcement Bay could do the same. However, there were a few key differences between the two. For one, Reinforcement Bays were strictly used for military purposes particularly for GDI, as the bays were commonly built in blue zones. The Brotherhood of Nod would make use of these structures, as seen during their assault on the Goddard Space Center. Capturing the reinforcement bay located at the space station let Nod link the bay's underground network to their own, allowing them to bring infantry reinforcements directly into the space center. Secondly, unlike the subway, the reinforcement bay could transport ground vehicles, including mech walkers like the Juggernaut. A couple of Juggernauts and Sniper teams were brought into Cologne via a reactivated reinforcement bay to support GDI forces in driving the Skrin out of the city, or at least what was left of it. Lastly, as long as a subway hub and its entrance were left standing, they could be used indefinitely to transport troops across the battlefield. However, a reinforcement bay only had a one-time detachment of reinforcements. So once these reinforcements arrived, the bay was all but useless. In the year 2037, the mutant tribes of the Forgotten disappeared in a self-imposed exile into the Tiberium Wastelands. In 2042, as a show of goodwill toward the vanished mutant population, GDI deployed G-330X habitat modules on the borders of Red Zones. Since then, some mutants have taken up residence within these T-shaped structures. These mutants look very different from the ones seen during the Second Tiberium War, being noticeably taller and more muscular than the average human. This was due to continued Tiberium mutation from their years spent living out in the Red Zones. Both GDI and Nod hired mutants to fight for them during the Second Tiberium War, and continued to make use of these mutant marauders during the Third Tiberium War. On battlefields close to the borders of Red Zones, one could typically find a couple of mutant hovels. Engineers and saboteurs could make contact with the denizens of these hovels to establish a working relationship with them. Their relationship with GDI, or Nod, almost always involved hiring out the Marauders as mercenaries to fight on their behalf. Marauders were strong units, armed with a minigun, capable of shredding infantry and targeting light aircraft. Most importantly, Marauders were invaluable to conducting combat operations in the middle of Tiberium fields. Not only were Marauders immune to the Crystal's radiation, but could actively heal from it. On top of that, the Marauders were stealthy while standing idle within the field, waiting to ambush unsuspecting victims. 
Stopping these marauders from attacking one's forces was as simple as destroying the hovel from which they were hired. When it came to transporting supplies, ammunition, or other vital equipment, the Brotherhood of Nod, Global Defense Initiative, private companies, and other neutral factions would store these materials inside crates. As a quick author's note, we are very much entering the realm of gameplay logic for this chapter of the video, especially when it comes to the more powerful pickups one can attain from crates. During the First Tiberium War, crates were cube-shaped and could be found hidden in civilian buildings or located in the middle of a military base. The crates found in villages normally contained money, whereas those under the protection of military personnel held vital weapon components or technology, such as the Tiberium components that I mentioned earlier in the video during the Elemental Imperative Covert Operation. By the time of the Second Tiberium War, most crates found on the battlefield featured a polyhedron design. However, the contents are mostly the same as those found during the First Tiberium War. Besides credits, these contents included medical supplies to heal infantry, and spare parts to repair damaged vehicles or nearby structures. A crate may even contain a cloaking device, providing stealth to the unit that acquired it. A crate could contain maps and charts of the local region, enabling the commander to see through the fog of war. Alternatively, some crates may have a kind of communications jammer that shrouded the commander's digital map. Perhaps this technology was salvaged from gap generators that were used by the Allies during the Second World War. Generators that were hidden inside a crate that, when picked up, shrouded the commander's surrounding. Having your surroundings shrouded in darkness was bad, but it would be even worse if the crate was an improvised explosive device, destroying any units that picked it up. The explosions could be large or small. During the Second Tiberium War, some crates were armed with a chemical explosive. These were probably created by the Brotherhood, who used Tiberium-based chemical missiles at this time. Both GDI and the Brotherhood seemed very willing to use crates to transport devices that activated powerful superweapons. This included access to beacons for the Ion Cannon, and launch codes to a nuclear missile during the First Tiberium War. Alternatively, a crate could contain a nuclear device, which would be triggered upon pickup. Missileroids could be found in some crates, perhaps initially intended to be dropped off at a lab somewhere. Not only could a commander find superweapons in a crate, but one could also find a random unit, usually a ground vehicle. This included vehicles like the MCV, which is frankly quite ridiculous given their size. Some crates during the Second Tiberium War contained extra armor that could be retrofitted onto a unit to provide greater protection, a more powerful weapon or modification to an existing weapon, to provide improved firepower, or a more powerful engine for increased speed on ground vehicles. There could also be better equipment, like upgraded boots, to increase a soldier's movement speed. Missile launch codes found inside crates were associated with Nod's multi-missile during the Second Tiberium War. Tiberium, both blue and green, could be found inside some crates. Lastly, some units received promotions as a reward for finding and claiming crates on behalf of their respective faction. At the time of the Third Tiberium War, the crate had gone through another redesign. Both GDI and Nod rely on mobility and rapid deployment for success. Armies seem to come and go all the time as the balance of power shifts, often very quickly. Given the haste with which these operations are conducted, it's not a surprise that a lot of equipment is being left behind. Our blue zones and yellow zones are becoming littered with logistics crates filled with military spares, data cores, and other equipment and supplies. Both sides use the modular G-771G container, a standard crate used by the commercial shipping industry for decades. You'll find these containers everywhere, and they should be considered targets of opportunity for our boys in the field. If your troops crack one of these containers open, odds are they'll find something useful. The G-771G containers are easy to spot. Just look for geometric gray crates tread with diagonal stripes. They stick out like a sore thumb, and anyone can pop them open with a bit of elbow grease. GDI and Nod no longer transported superweapons or other advanced technologies in standard containers. In addition, they didn't rig the crates with any explosives, as there was a chance their own forces would be killed by them. 
Crates were now limited to medical supplies for healing, spare parts to repair damaged vehicles, upgrades to a unit's armor or firepower, credits, veterancy, or a new ground unit for a commander's army. Given the scale of the Third Tiberium War, it should be no surprise that in its aftermath, there are a large number of crates scattered throughout red, yellow, and former blue zones. This is in addition to desert subway networks or privately owned Tiberium spikes. Perhaps GDI will consider making a significant effort to reactivate some of the abandoned EMP control centers and defensive turrets, assuming they weren't all destroyed during the war or under control of what is left of the Brotherhood. Alternatively, GDI may instead focus their efforts inward on rebuilding their war-ravaged blue zones. And with the majority of the Brotherhood now concentrated at Threshold Tower 19, the Yellow Zones may deteriorate further into lawlessness and anarchy, culminating in the rise of warlords, bands of marauding mutants, and other rogue factions, all taking the opportunity to accumulate as much territory and power as they can on an increasingly Tiberian Earth. <laughs>